Dr. Clark, Dan, thank you guys. Um, what is your response to Bertrand Russell and Problems of Philosophy, Chapter 6? He says, it's been argued that we have reason to know that the future will resemble the past because what, was the fu what the future has constantly become the past and has always been found to resemble the past so that we really have experience of the future, namely of times which were formerly future, which we may, may call past futures. But such an argument really begs the very question at issue. We have experience of past futures, but not of future futures. And the question is, will future futures resemble past futures? This question is not to be answered by an argument which starts from past futures alone. We have therefore still to seek for some principle which shall enable us to know that the future will follow the same laws as the past. What is your response to Bertrand Russell, atheist in Problems of Philosophy? My first response is to you, and I remind the audience that the topic of this debate was not presuppositionalism. The topic of this debate was not for us to prove logic exists. The topic is, does the triune God of an errant Bible exist? And you'll notice the shell game that he's playing, even though I pointed out to this as the very first point. He's still going back to, my God is responsible for everything, and therefore, if you even show up at this debate, I won. Um, please, right? That as, as Dan has pointed out, as I have pointed out, as you all laughed at Thor, you're not Mormons. I get that. That's the point, is you reject all of that stuff. And there's all these gods out here. So the question is not, does inductive logic work? The question is, does the triune God exist of the Bible? Okay, so that said, that said, I just want to remind everybody what the debate actually is supposed to be. And so far, they've con continually avoid it. So the answer is inductive logic does not, is imperfect, and it does not provide 100% So you have no certainty. answer to Bertrand Russell's problem of induction? My, my answer is inductive logic is not imperfect. It I didn't say not inductive logic, logic, sir. I said the problem of induction, the uniformity in nature, not merely inductive logic. God Bertrand, did it, provides no explanation whatsoever that's not already in its assumption, and one could just as well say Godzilla did it, and if you want to explain why Godzilla didn't do it, then go right ahead. But that answer is self-referential and empty. Dr. Clark, our question is about your methodology, your criticisms, and your worldview and the consistency I, thereof. I understand your questions want to be about a change in the debate topic. It not, so has we, nothing to do oh, with changing excuse the debate me, it topic, very sir. Much is. It very much is. Uh, okay, for, so for example, can, right, Godzilla, I'll give an answer. I'll give an answer, and you can show me that it's about it. Uh, Godzilla is all-powerful. You're not allowed to question his existence because he is your creator. This is their argument. And therefore, the fact that logic exists, that inductive logic exists, is proof that Godzilla exists. So, Dr. Clark, you've now abandoned atheism and you're a Godzillaite? I am saying that those are equally Can you provide useless. now a justification with Godzillaism for a principle of induction? I you am, haven't solved the problem, Dr. Clark. I am Dr. providing Clark. equivalence between what your audience laughed Dr. at Clark, with next respect question. to Thor, Dr. Clark, with respect to Godzilla, thank you, sir. and thank somehow you, sir. wants to pay you next to question. keep preaching. Did, next did you want to know my answer? I would, Dan. Thank okay, you. Thank sure. You. Thank you. Yes. I would just say that I have no idea. I don't know. Bertrand, Rass Bertrand Russell himself didn't know. So, He's a hell of a lot smarter than I so am. So, Dan, you live by faith? No, I don't. Would you say that you have confidence in the principle of induction? Sure. So you are with faith? No, Con I am fide? not with faith. Confide, with faith. Confidence means with <laughs> well, faith. Well, it depends. I mean, that's a loaded term, right? Uh, what, give well, me your definition of faith. Well, it, you have trust, but there are different types of trust. There's trust with evidence, with justification, and then there's blind, ignorant trust. You have no basis to believe that the laws of logic are uniform. You have no basis to believe that the next five seconds you won't float away to the ceiling because you just depend on faith. Or you that God no could maybe do that. I mean, if he breaks these laws of logic all the time through miracles, you're right. I have no basis uh, to say confusing, that. You're confusing categories. When you talk about breaks laws of logic with miracles... What we're really talking about with miracles is the uniformity in nature. And now you're borrowing again from our worldview, so I ask again, you depend on the uniformity in nature for miracles to be odd events. What we say is God is sovereign and he imposes uniformity upon creation, therefore miracles are strange with the triune God of Scripture. We're supposed to see uh, dead men rising and go, that's weird. In your worldview, 
Weird things happen all the time. Fish become philosophers. There's all kinds no, of strange occurrences. No, they don't. Humans become philosophers. Well, you do I don't, believe... I, don't, I mean, I can't, I can't explain to you why you can't seem to grasp that or why you don't understand Dan, evolution, but that's not my Dan, problem. Dan, do you that's believe your fish problem. became philosophers through a long result of random No, fish do mutations. not become philosophers. So I'll so, say it again. Fish do not become so philosophers. Do you Humans you are, do. Do you, are, you believe you were descended from fish somewhere in the chain? I don't know that I came from fish. Do, would you agree in the, with... In a long causal chain of evolution, yes, early ancestors were not land-roving people. Were they fish? Were my ancestors fish? Yes. Yes, so were yours. So you do believe your ancestors were fish? Yes. So we finally, we have that down now. Good. Thank you, Dan. You're very yeah. welcome. Dan, Dan, do you, do you eat I have, fish? I have, a lot of, I have a lot of people who actually study evolution really, really carefully that I'd be happy to point you to some of their work happy and they to can read explain them. it to you. Now, Dan, do you eat fish? Yes, I okay. do. Uh, Dan, if you have ancestors who are fish and you eat fish today, let me ask you a question. What's the distinction between you and other random results of evolutionary processes? Why do you uphold human value and dignity above, say, snails, horses, dogs, and, dogs and rocks? Well, I have yet to see a horse that could reason as well as I can. So but if it reasons better, it is more valuable and has more dignity? Not necessarily, no, but I think it holds, I think it holds more weight, right? Like, I think you would also say that a rock isn't as important as a human being or anything else, it's right? Not it's not the image of God. I it's would a rock. Yeah. Oh, a rock is. I'm sorry. Say that again. A rock is. We would say the rock is not an image. Is not the image of God. Human beings are the image of God. So, on what basis do? Well, let me ask it this way. You say if it reasons better, it has more value. What if a segment of humanity? grows large and draws a smaller circle around themselves and say, we reason better than your group, therefore we'll exterminate you. Are they right for doing that? I think we would need to be able to have a way to test those claims, and they would have to be able to demonstrate that their claims are more correct. So That's possible, how we do that. It is possible for a segment of humanity to draw a smaller circle around their group and exterminate other groups. Not only is it possible, we see it happen way too often. Right. Is it wrong? Yeah, I believe it is. Is it absolutely morally wrong? Tell me what you mean by absolutely morally wrong. Is it an art wrong? that exists outside of my own preferences and my own likes and dislikes? Is it something that's true whether I like it or not? Well, as I've said, I believe that the, lo the laws of logic exist. We're talking about ethics. Okay. Not laws of logic. Okay, are you saying that is there an absolute ethical standard uh, in... Let me like ask some you. ultimate well, let me, absolute could I, could I, could I quote ethical you? standard. You, you right? specifically said, we don't need an invisible sky fairy to tell us we are to be good to each other. So given that Stalin and Mao were both atheists and were responsible for hundreds of millions of deaths, why didn't they need a sky fairy to tell them what to do in light of what you're saying? Is there an absolute moral standard that says Auschwitz was wrong, that I do Mao not was know. wrong. I do not know if there's an absolute moral standard that says a Auschwitz was wrong. So how can you, how make can you claim, condemn them? But you've not offered us any evidence for that claim. You've simply asserted that your God exists. If there what was is, an empty... What is if the there evidence was, of the existence okay, you can for ask, your God? You can ask us those questions when it's your turn. Sure. But when you say, when you say what you said right now, do you not see a difference between our saying that there is an empty tomb that was prophesied beforehand and the one who came out of that tomb gave us his law and your argument for Godzillism. That's not my argument. Oh, okay, so there's <laughs> it, a division I mean, on the great, other side. It would be okay. great if, you'd, if right. you didn't strong right. my position right. or tell me what my position Dr. is. Clarkson You're welcome to good. ask me what it is. Okay. That would be great. Okay. So, uh, and may I ask another? Really? Okay, so another question uh, since off, off the issue of the uniformity in nature and the principle of induction, uh, what are the laws of logic and how are they justified? Uh, there's the law. Uh, let me look them up here just so that I don't mess it you up. You don't have to go through the different distinctions in laws and categories, but what are they in an atheistic perspective? We argued in the opening statement that the laws of logic reflect the thinking of God. God is unchanging. God cannot lie. Therefore, God cannot engage in logical contradiction. We have a principium, a reference point, a standard outside of ourselves for universal, abstract, unchanging laws of thought that God imposes upon creation and expects us to think about what is your justification, Dan? 
I'm saying that you don't have justification for that, or at least you haven't demonstrated it. You've made an assertion, but you've not demonstrated it. You've not provided any evidence well, Dan, for that. Respectfully, you can ask that question, but what is your I'm not asking a question. I'm making a statement. Right. You're, you're asserting that this is the case. You have yet to offer any evidence for that. The question being asked of you in cross-examination right now is, what are the laws of logic from an atheistic perspective, and how are they justified in your worldview? They're justified under my worldview because they comport with the reality in which I find myself. Are they material in nature? No, I don't believe so. So... Laws of logic are not material in nature. So no, have, numbers are not either. So, so very but good. But they so, exist. Okay, so, they, so you do believe there are immaterial aspects to reality. There are abstract, con, abstract concepts with which we can, we can think about how the world works through using those abstract concepts. Are these concepts, abstract yes. concepts conventional in nature? Tell me what you mean by conventional Do in nature. Do we determine and stipulate as humans what these laws of logic are? Are they conventional? We determine what they are. I don't understand your question still. Laws of logic, do they, exi do they exist? Are they real? I just told you I think they're abstract concepts. Okay, are these abstract concepts things that humans by convention have merely stipulated? Or are they things that, are they things that exist would as... Would be true without human beings? There you go. Uh, I believe that they would be. Yeah, I believe that they would be here whether human beings were here or not. But, I mean, if they were here and no human was around to observe them, then it's... So, I mean, it's a fun thing to think thank about. You, but, no, I appreciate that very yeah. much. So what would be your justification for uh, appealing to immaterial abstract universals, given your materialism? Can you ask me that again? Sure. As an atheist, I assume you're a materialist? Yes. Okay, so you believe all that, it, all that exists is matter? Uh, that's all that I've been able to have any demonstration for. Okay, so on what basis yes. are you holding to immaterial laws? Because you just said you believe the laws of logic are immaterial. So yeah, where do they believe, come from? I believe numbers are immaterial also, but I also we believe agree. that they are useful and exist. And we agree. And then where do really, they come from? Yeah, so where do they come from? From human thought. So they are merely conventional. What do you mean by merely conventional? Human beings convene and stipulate what a law of logic or a law of arithmetic is. No, I'm, I just told you that I believe the laws of logic would be around whether humans created them or, or thought of them or were around to Thank recognize you. No, that, them that, I appreciate that. Uh, if I could ask uh, Dr. Clark a, a quick question. Um, you, uh, there was criticism made of, uh, you said they didn't even try to address the Trinity. Uh, Dr. Clark, did you read my book on the Trinity? I did not read your book. Do you, do you, how much do you sound like for? I'm surprised. Well, you know, if someone <laughs> I'll, had a copy. I'll co accept a free copy. Someone, if someone had a, had a <laughs> copy out there, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to get you a free copy. That's, that's not an you issue. You know how many books I had to, like I, how many versions of the Bible I had to plow through? Like, I thought that was a sacrifice enough, but, but so, whatever. <laughs> so when we say the triune God of Scripture is important in this debate, you stood somewhere in the walking around up here, you stood there and talked about, well, it's three, it's one, it's three, it's one. Do you not understand even what we're saying when we say the triune God of Scripture? I actually would appreciate clarification of what, what that means. As you may know, Thomas Jefferson thought, not that I'm quoting authority, but it's a good point and I'm giving credit, was that actually it's hard to make sense of it. And I tried actually to have this discussion, as you know, because well, you probably know, because Jason actually forwarded my emails to you, trying to get a handle of what the triune God. And I will freely admit, I started off thinking um, that, that I would be able to get a better handle on it than I did, and I failed. Could I, I, could I ask if most of your interaction with religious people has been here in Utah? Uh, of course not. No. So you're from someplace else? Uh, I am. Okay. So you recognize that, for example, Mormonism is not Trinitarian? Well, actually, if you want to have a, a reasonable discussion on this, um, <laughs> what I actually found going into the debate, which was that there were several topics proposed, by the way, and several of them were rejected, and, and the ones they're focusing on are the ones that were rejected. So just as a reminder, and, and, and one of the issues was what is the nature of this triune God and Mormonism versus uh, tr classical or conventional Trinitarianism like in Catholicism and so forth. And I thought I actually um, understood the Mormon position better than I, or, or the distinction better than I do. 
Okay, because I always thought, well, okay, great, because in Mormonism, actually, it's Jesus who formed the creation, and it's Jesus who demanded um, that if you uh, have uh, relationships with animals, which was God's plan, uh, that you should be killed and all the rest, that it was Jesus of the Old Testament. So, so that is a distinction. But actually, when I, I tried to grapple with it and, and understand what three personages meant, and I looked at the material that, that um, uh, 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 Jason was kind enough to send to me and read up on the Trinitarian view, the honest truth is I can't wrap my head around what it means to have three distinct persons who's actually just one person. I, I, I'm, I, I'd be loved to have someone clarify it. It's probably too long for this debate, but I don't get it. Man. Well, you know, God can change my mind. Right? He changed the Pharaoh's mind. He hardened their hearts so that the Pharaoh would not let his people go, his God's people go, so that God could slaughter the firstborns and show what a wonderful God he is, rather than just letting his people go. So is that a question? Changing, changing his mind. What? Was that a question? No, I'm, I'd I'm be getting, happy to address it if, if you find that no, objectionable. No, it's not a question. It's a cl- oh, okay. Well, I was going to get to that. Since God can read minds, and since God can plant thoughts in my mind, I have a trinity of numbers here. What are they? Is that supposed to be a question either? Yes, that is a question. I'm not Johnny Carson. That is a question. (laughs) Your all-powerful God can do this. He changed the Pharaoh's heart. Jason is spending time praying for my mind to change. So God, he clearly believes. Do you think God can can change my mind? Yes, you okay. change your heart. You'd have to change your heart first. Uh, well, you know, we think actually with our, our minds. That may be, but your heart, yet, your heart, if you it don't gives know, you the desires. If you don't know, if you take an artificial heart and put it in a person, they still I know think. That. Uh, good, good. Yeah, and you but, know where but, the sun goes at night, right? Uh, yeah. I, uh, here's, good, can good. I, can I Can I respond to anything you're saying? Or are yeah, you just going to rail dude. on? I'm that, asking that's you. absurd. I'm okay, that's an absurd question, but I would like to respond. Miracles are absurd. Of course, Miracles I didn't say that. Absurd. Could, I, okay. could I answer Speaking, the question? That, no, no, I asked you a question. And I, here's the question. We've got miracles ready to happen, right? Ready to happen. But, but they didn't happen. Why is it that miracles never occur except when there are things that would happen anyway? Let's go to one of God's tests. Is that, is that a question? We, we have questions. That, that is a claim. And I asked a question. Okay, and can he I? Said okay, let's, let's address, let me address miracles. First no, of no, all, no, miracles. That's not my question. My questions are, show me, okay? It looks like you want another 15 minutes to talk. You're not asking questions. So so, so here's my question. The Baal test, you're familiar with it, right? You're an expert on the Bible. Tell us the story of Baal. Which? And and, and Elijah and and Ahab. There are many Baals, sir. Which which one do you have? So the story of Ahab and Elijah and and their test of, of a true God. You're familiar with that story. Quite. Okay. And so I was just, you, I was just in Israel where it happened, story. actually. And so the, the, the ball test was that, that if you are a believer, that a fake God would not set something on fire and a real God would. So you've read the text? Uh, yeah, I have read the text. And so okay, I asked so you, can, I can answer you now? do that? Can I can, answer now? Can you do that? Will Here's you allow question. an answer, sir? Will yes, you sit down and allow an answer? My question is this. Can you do that? Yes or no? No, he cannot do that. Okay, oh, I'm so going to try, I'm gonna try to give an answer here. Miracle number two doesn't happen. Okay. okay. Miracle number three. Show sir, me, show me, sir, show me. This is absurd. Of course it's absurd. Let this me is your answer book the absurd. question. Lighting stuff on fire. How many of you would like to hear an answer absurd. to the question? Yes. Sit down. Sit down. Look, I need to stand up because I need to see you. I need to hear. You need to at least pause and allow an answer. Okay, here's okay. my answer. If yes. you need to see me to hear the answer, let Thank me you. give you the answer. Yes. I was just in Israel at the point where this happened. If you've read the text, yes. these were covenant people, and they were going after another god, a god who had already said that they would be punished if they did this thing, and they are the ones That's who then... So- yes, it was. No. If you can ignore the context of the that particular is, can passage... You do that? Can I do what? Call fire down out of heaven? Yeah. Not in this context, no, sir. Okay, can you do any... Let me ask you another question, simple question. Did you hear my answer? Yeah. There are times when God uses miracles, and there are times when God does not to specifically establish his word in Scripture. That time has passed. 
Now we have the church, sir, and we have the fact that God changes hearts as he has many people in this room. Oh, isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? So, you, you know, as, as Mr. Wallace pointed out to me, th there's a funny thing, and I wonder if you can figure it out. Is this a question for us? Yes, it is, in just a second. Okay, but I, I'm, I'm going to give you the context, right? Just like you spent all this time saying no in a minute, right? And, and the context was this. George Bernard Shaw, and I, I credit Wallace for pointing this out to me, said, you know the miracles that happen at Lourdes? Like people get out of wheelchairs and they drop crutches but they never drop an artificial leg because God doesn't heal amputees, as was pointed out. They also don't grow hair. So the question is, can you grow hair on, on, on Dr. White right now? No, of course not, because the only miracles... Can you do it? Can you do it, Jeff? What's that? Can you do it, Jeff? Can I do what? All I was going to do is steal my razor, and that's, right. that'll, that'll grow back naturally. Right. So, so Dr. White claims that biblical miracles are still happening Dr. Clark, today. this is devolving. If, if no, no, you no, could allow me to answer the, the question. Okay, so it's so, a simple question. Can you grow hair on his head right now, just like Jesus at once performed his miracles? Because Dr. White claims that miracles are still happening scripture, today. No, actually, Dr. Claim, uh, Dr. White has not claimed it in that way at all. You are misrepresenting him. It's not going to help us if you put words in our mouths. What our position is, is that the triune God of Scripture exists and that he imposes uniformity upon creation. He upholds it by the word of his power and carries it along to I'm his asking intended... about miracles. Show me, not presuppositionalism. I am telling you right now. He carries it along to its intended destination. Therefore, we have a philosophical basis, something that satisfies the preconditions of intelligibility to appeal to uniformity, to make miracles look odd. Further, our God is the triune, holy, holy, holy God. We are sinners, rebels in a fallen creation. And, sir, we have no right to look up to God and tell him, you do as I say. And I am very, very glad, certainly glad for your sake tonight, sir, that God doesn't allow us to call down fire upon you. <laughs> I'm worried about that in the same sense I'm worried about Dracula coming. And what okay. would that so, say about your moral convictions? Well, I would say, well, let, me, hold, let, me, hold on. let me answer that, that question. When you talk about no, morals... No, I think it's still my question, well, and then Dan, Dan can answer. Yeah. He asked a okay. question. You've had a few, sir, just to show respect to Dan. I appreciate it, Dan. Thank well, you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so how are, how are when, when, oh, you, when sure. you asked that question, Dan, it's interesting because just a few moments ago, we asked a question about absolute moral uh, values and moral oughts, mm -hmm. and you had no argument against Auschwitz. No, that's not at all the case. You have no ultimate argument against that. Okay, I have no ultimate argument against it because I don't even know what the hell that means. You don't know what, what do it means for Nazis what do you mean to exterminate ultimate, Jews? What do you mean an ultimate? Something that's true outside of your own likes and dislikes, your own experience, something that's true outside of your own community. It's true whether you like it or not. It's ultimate. You haven't objective. demonstrated that you have that either. You well, I, simply I, I, made assertion. I told you that apart from the Christian God, you can't make sense of human experience, ethics, morality, That's epistemology. yet again a simple and assertion. I'm You've offered you, no evidence for that. And I'm demonstrating to you right now that we have a basis to uphold your human value and dignity. You say you have a basis Dan, for it, and yet you have not the, I'm finish provided the any I'm evidence the for that answering. basis. We've demonstrated that we have a basis, a philosophical. You've consistent not demonstrated basis. it. You've asserted it, Dan. If I could finish the thought, and then you could come right back and ask the question. Hey, absolutely. And, and in you just keep saying the same thing. So I have God to make sure that people know that that's not to, the case. We have a basis to complain, to complain about Auschwitz. You don't. Bullshit. <laughs> so that's like, another question. <laughs> <laughs> So no, I don't think it was. You, you've, you've admitted <laughs> that your perspective is that our ancestors were fish and that there are no ultimate values and oughts outside of our own experience or mere convention. You've essentially stipulated that position. And so with your position, you have no complaint about anything ethically at all. You can't tell me that I have no complaint because no, I, I absolutely do. No, I know you do because you're do. an image bearer you're of God. Say, you're saying that I, have, that I need to have an ultimate authority for it. Dan, you're in the image of God. I don't need an ultimate authority do. for that. I, I admit this, and I'm going to say this with a lot of respect to you. Yeah. You're in the image of God, and you do complain about things that are immoral. God needs but to lose some weight. that's because you're in his image. <laughs> I, I would encourage, uh, I, I defer to you to ask questions. I realize that there's getting a banter back here. It's your time to ask questions of them. Actually, I can, can I ask a very quick question? Very quick. I, 
If you can answer it, yes or no, that would be great. Otherwise, we may. The audience is moaning, Dr. Clark. <laughs> Do you hallucinate often? Do I hallucinate often? Yes. Now I just I've, yes or no. No, not often. I did not before often. twenty uh, years James ago. James White, do you hallucinate? There was a lot of ecstasy and marijuana involved, uh, 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 and that okay. was so. So that James was about White, it. do you hallucinate often? Okay. I say I hallucinate often, and I say they hallucinate often. Everybody, close one eye. Okay. Look at me. You don't see anything weird. I'll project into what I think you see. And yet you all knew since first grade that you had a blind spot in your eye because you have no photoreceptors there because the intelligently designed eye has a hole in it where you can't see. But you don't see that you can't see. And what they're seeing is hallucinations and they claim they don't even know it. Dr. Clark, this is another question. You can cover all that in the I am telling you that they have just given okay, a, let me, an answer let me, that you let, can I'll all respond to that. at home tonight. Everyone in the room tonight knows the difference between the term hallucination and the fact that there is a blind spot that we all have recognized and seen due to physical science. It's not the same thing. It is our, our sight system filling in and allowing us to function in a meaningful fashion in this world. That's not the same thing as a hallucination. We're playing on words here. Could we get to some serious questions, please? That, act that actually is a very serious question. None of you can tell very easily which part of that is made up by your brain versus actually a stimulus out there in the real world. And when you see stuff that's not in the real world, that's a hallucination. Dr. Clark, your comment, we need to have questions. We only have four minutes and change left. Uh, I've got a question for could you. Could you real lean quick. forward so they could hear you? Because it's. Oh, yeah. sorry. Thank you. I try to project enough that you can hear me anyway, but. With that beard, you need to work real. I mean, <laughs> it, it muffles. It kind of yeah. muffles the sound a little bit sometimes. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm curious about the totality of God's message in revealing Himself to you. I know that you have said that He He writes the knowledge of His existence on our hearts and or minds, and reveals Himself further through Scripture. But you've said that people have, everybody has knowledge of God enough to, that they have no excuse for, for not believing in him, right? No defense. Is that basically, okay, no, no That's defense. That's Romans chapter it. one, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so when God revealed himself to you in your heart or mind, what was the totality of that message? Was it simply, I exist or... Hi, this is, this is God. I just wanted to let you know I love you and I'm here for you. No, 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 you're former LDS, right? Yes, I am. Okay, so this is, this is an area of major difference between Reformed Christians and, and the LDS faith because we believe that we were dead in our sin, that we are in rebellion against God. And in fact, the term that Paul uses is katakonton in the original language. We are suppressing the knowledge of him. That is not really a part of LDS theology that does not have any deep concept of man's depravity at all. We believe, because that's what Romans 1 is talking about. So we believe there has to be a miraculous changing of our heart, and we do not mean our physical heart. We mean the seat of our emotion and our desires. There has to be something called resurrection. God has to be the one who changes us and brings us to spiritual life. It's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual resurrection. It's radical, and it's not something that we bring about by our own actions. Well, right, but that wasn't my question. My question was, was there anything, like, what was the, ta what was, what's the totality yeah. of his message no, to you I, when no, he revealed you, it? Does that, does that make sense? No, very much, Dan. That's a great question. Thank you very much. I think it goes to what you asked the audience, too, and I, and I appreciated that moment where you ask our, our atheist friends in the audience, you know, are you an atheist? And they raise their hands in Salt Lake. They're like, yes. Like, you know, um, scared. Um, we love you. Uh, so, and I, I know, just, you know, there's a context of where we're at today. So it's interesting. Our claim when we say that atheists know God is not that they are going, I'm only pretending I really know God exists and I'm just going to suppress this and hold it down. What we're saying is that it is a knowledge that is inescapable and the problem is self-deception. And that goes to your question we ask, what does God reveal to a person when he opens their eyes and heart to see the truth? He reveals that he's holy. He reveals that's, that but that's not really my question. I, that you said sinful. that it's written on everybody's hearts and mind initially. We, we all have this knowledge. So what is that knowledge specifically? That God is, that he's the one and only true God. And the scriptural answer is that we are to glorify him and give thanks to him. That's the, it's, not, it's not the Trinity and all the rest of that stuff that is in the natural realm. 
it is that he exists and we are his creature. That's, that's his. So uh, let, let's be clear. It, this vague speak is not addressing the issue. God revealed, revealed to people. Is that a question, the, Dr. Clark? Yes. This is your question time. Yeah. Okay. The, what did God, how did Moses write down the books? Was that just this feeling or did he actually get this specific information that uh, fruit trees grew on earth before the sun and stars existed? Was that a revelation? Uh, yes, it's revelation. Okay. And so, when you, what, more, most meaningful responses require more than three seconds to express, okay? If you would actually read that with any concern about historical context